As we all know, language has been a vital part of our life since when we are young up until now. It is one of the very reasons why we were able to survive. As social animals, we need to communicate to others. And how do we do that? That is by using our language. Many scholars then have been dedicated to study what makes language a language, how it is being established, and eventually, what creates its meaning. Today, we are going to look into the fundamental philosophies of linguistics. But first, I would like you to answer this question. Which color is red? Were you able to identify it immediately? Or is it you got confused because your attention is first fixated with the word instead of the color of the font? The same then is true with the notion which have been debated by various linguistic philosophers. For them, among the fundamental issue revolves with, is it the words that stored in your mental dictionary that dictates how you see the world? Or is it the world that controls your mental dictionary and how you see things? This question relates to the primary concern of linguists and language scholars, how language is being established, and eventually its meaning. Let us start discussing our first linguistic philosophy, which is that of externalist. The proponent of this philosophy is Leonard Bloomfield. Primarily, it views that language belongs to a community of language users and that common language, or as their coined term, common alects, exists above and beyond individuals. Thus, the meaning of a term is determined in whole or in part by factors external to the speaker. As Hilary Putnam puts it, meaning just ain't in the head. Instead, it is basically determined by what is external to language user through its natural physical environment, which in the end affects how language user perceives and understand the world. For example, in my undergraduate thesis, my study focuses on the translation of cultural specific elements that could be found in the Book of Psalm. In the source text, which is written in English, there is this line that says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. As it was translated in Cebuano, it says, Mas dali pa kay sa kamilyo nga musulod sa buslot sa dagom kaysa dato nga musulod sa ginghalian sa ginoo. But the thing about this translation is, needle in Jewish culture refers not to the dagom in Cebuano. Rather, it is the narrow door which is built by the shepherd so that when it is time to keep the herd, each of them could actually follow a straight line and they could line up one by one upon entering the area where they are kept safely during nighttime. So you see, in this context, needle, though translated literally as dagom, does not capture the actual meaning of the source culture just because it is not existing in our environment. So if we are going to relate it to externalist perspective, for something to make sense and have meaning to a language user, it should exist in the environment where he or she is existing. The world then affects the mental dictionary of the user. The language that is being used is mainly affected by what is outside. Thus, the perception of the world by language users is influenced by what is present in the environment where he or she is in. Now, let us move on to the essentialist perspective. For an essentialist, meaning is not created or influenced by the environment. Instead, it depends on the way speakers use the words or signs, which are only meaningful because of the user's intention. Without the intention, meaning will not exist. 
So how one sees the world is mainly related to what is in his or her head. According to essentialist, certain word refers to a natural category in virtue to that of the others. For example, if anything that has four legs are considered as dogs, but then goats and cats also have four legs, so what makes the concept of the word dog different from that of other animals that have four legs? Dogs can bark while other animals could not. So technically, meaning exists because of the oppositions. For something to be meaningful, an opposite concept should also be there. And the last linguistic philosophy that we're going to tackle this morning is that of emergentist, which basically believes that language is primarily a cultural and social product instead of believing with a preordained design or natural reason why language existed. Emergentists mainly emphasize that language arises due to the created restrictions of humans in order to achieve certain goal, communication, and socialization needs. Meaning then, according to essentialists, is socially and culturally constructed. And language will only be activated if there is a physical stimuli that provides contextualization. For example, there is this tribe in Africa called Maasai people. And knowing their environment, snow does not exist. Now, I have seen this RTA documentary entitled Maasai from Sand to Snow. Its aim is to let this African tribe experience snow for the first time. The thing on it is, since snow does not exist in their environment and no stimuli could actually trigger for Maasai people to have a concept of snow, the documentary team decided to bring them to Russia so they will experience what snow is and the feel of it. By this example, culture and the physical setting then contributes to the formation of language. As a conclusion, although many philosophies have been established and will be established in order to explain language and how it is developed, but at the end of the day, no philosophy is better than that of the other. Because the reconciliation of each idea and views of each philosophy, I believe, will surely capture what language is all about. Language is a product of what is in the mind, the physical environment, the culture, and the socialization of language users.